Twitch is doing it. My name's Gray. It's uh, really nice to, to have you all here and to meet you all. Um, I work at NCFE in the assessment innovation team. Um, and um, we've got some really interesting, hopefully you'll find it interesting things to share with you today, both from our um, some of our innovation projects, but also um, um, a bit of information about our innovation fund. Okay, so um, we're, like I say, I work at NCFE. I think um, if most of you are um, joining us from uh, north of the border in Scotland, uh, which is what I'm expecting, uh, you might not have heard of NCFE, um, because we're very much, um, or most of our market is in England. Um, so we're an educational charity. Um, we've been around a, a very long time in lots of different iterations. Um, we're currently uh, a, a major awarding body for the vocational and technical sector um, and um, awarding something like 500 uh, different qualifications every year. Um, but as well as an awarding body, we're also a charity and, and uh, our um, purpose, if you like, uh, our charitable purpose is to um, promote and advance learning. Um, and that's where our innovation assessment innovation fund comes in that we want to tell you all about today. So like I said before, thank you so much for coming. Um, we uh, have got about an, uh, an hour or so of um, things to show you and tell you about, um, including a bit about us. We're going to hear from three of our projects um, and we um, and you're going to hear about the Assessment Innovation Fund. Um, and then we've got a half an hour slot at the end to hear from you about your ideas and we can have some sort of hopefully really good discussions about the problems that you're facing and the solutions that you think you might have. So um, if I just um, make a start then on what what we, what we do at NCFE, like I said, I'm, um, I work in the assessment innovation team. Um, and so our team is focused on um, innovation and analytics with the purpose to um, implement a radical new approach to assessment. Um, and when we say assessment, we're talking about assessing learner needs, assessing learner progress, assessing learner attainment, which I guess is um, where we spend most of our time at the moment, but not necessarily where we will be in the future. Um, and um, those assessments should support our, our customers and teachers, obviously our learners, um, and um, support for a better learning experience, a better learning journey is what we hope. So um, how are we doing this? Well, we've, we've built a skills and learner value chain. Um, and I wanted to just concentrate on the right hand side of this chain for now. This is where me and my team work. Um, and really, if you have a look at the loop on the right hand side, we're looking for and testing out innovations in all five of these stages. So um, whereas you might think, oh, an awarding body, they're going to be interested in summative assessment. And that's the fourth stage on, on the loop there. Um, you're going to be interested in new ideas for how to, you know, sit, uh, you know, how, how to um, take exams or how to um, uh, assess coursework or um, whatever it might be that gives us, gives the learner their kind of final outcome, pass, fail, grade, etc. Um, but actually, we're interested in the whole of the learning journey. So from before a learner starts a program and then maybe trying to think about what it is they want to do, what do they want to get out of a learning program? Why do they want to do it? What's their career career ambitions? Um, to the initial onboarding phase where we might be doing things like diagnostics, working out what this what this person's bringing to the program from their prior learning, um, into the on program to support really good teaching and learning. Um, uh, obviously, the summative assessment is there at the end. Um, and I don't really need to, to tell you what that might look like. But then um, following that a progression stage where um, we know that learners are trying to figure out what to do next. So are they looking to get in to use their, their new kind of knowledge and new qualification to get into work, to get into a next stage of education? Uh, if it's work, do they have they got CPD that they want to undertake whilst they're on the job and all that kind of thing? So um, when we're talking about assessment, please don't um, just go straight to that summative assessment point. We are definitely interested in assessment at all of those different stages in the learner journey. 
and I've just got some descriptions there um, of what it might um, of what what might be happening at those different points. I don't need to read through that. I don't think I've, I've just kind of talked through it a little bit anyway. Um, but also as um, people in the sector, you'll know what learners need really at those different points. They need um, you know um, information. They need advice. They need um, they need kind of progress checking and, and all that kind of thing that we that we just mentioned. Um, so that's kind of how we see um, the learning, the learner journey um, and the assessment that sits at each of these different stages is what we're interested in innovating and working on and, and what our, our fund is designed to do. So how do we do it? Well, we, we've got two ways of funding innovations. We've got uh, an assessment innovation fund, which is the main topic of today's, um, today's discussion. Um, and so I'm not going to talk through that now because you're going to hear all about that um, over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, let me briefly tell you about our sandbox testing environment, which is um, uh, which is a, 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 a place where we can test new ideas that have come from NCFE. Um, whether that's come from the work that we do in horizon scanning, um, talking to other people, um, or whether that's come from internally from colleagues at NCFE. And so we built this kind of process, I guess is the best word for it, um, which can um, design, um, um, put into play and then validate new ideas for um, assessment at any of those learning stages that, um, that NCFE you know, want to do. And I, I guess maybe those activities are more aligned with some of our commercial activity in terms of being an awarding body. And maybe they might, turn some of that activity might turn into new products or services for our customers. Um, so that's kind of um, our, our sort of internal place that we can go and test innovation. And it's and the reason I'm kind of laboring this point a bit is that what it allows us to do is have an external place where we can fund innovation through our assessment innovation fund. Um, that doesn't have to be aligned strategically to our commercial aims, but it can be aligned to our charitable aims. So um, if we kind of separate those two things for the rest of the morning, we can talk about our charitable aims, which is to promote advanced learning. And that learning can happen anywhere. So whilst our commercial operation is focused in vocational and technical, that doesn't mean the assessment innovation fund has to be. Whilst um, our commercial uh, operation is mainly focused in post-16, that doesn't mean the um, assessment innovation fund has to be. So, um, and, and also um, a really important point from today, whilst most of our market is in England, the assessment innovation fund can be focused anywhere um, and is already focused in lots of places outside England. Um, so that's kind of um, a little introduction to our fund. Hopefully you're getting the idea that it's a really um, open, um, uh, fund open opportunity for anybody to apply to who's got a really good idea about innovating some um, a, a form of assessment at some point in the learning journey. So I'm going to um, be quiet in a second uh, and I'm going to introduce um, our speakers for today. Um, first of all, we've got, um, well, first of all, can I say thank you um, to both, uh, to, to, to Peter, Aftab, Rebecca and Nikki um, for giving up some time today. Um, the first project we're going to talk about or showcase with you um, is from the University of Newcastle in Australia. That's not Newcastle, England. Um, and they are, and, and Peter at the at the university there is running a project around um, digital badges and, the, and what the impact of replacing grades with digital badges are on some of his undergraduate um, students. Um, then we've got um, Aftab, morning Aftab. Um, from Bolton College, who's got a project with us um, that's fairly that's um, in its sort of fairly early stages, um, but looking at real time feedback. And after we'll tell you all about that and his um, first pass platform that Bolton College have been developing. Um, and then Rebecca and Nikki from Calderdale are going to tell us about their um, uh, AIF project, which is using sim centers and um, augmented or virtual reality to try and replicate some of the assessment needed in health and social care um, programs. Now, um, if we had Peter live, it would kind of be the middle of the night. So I haven't got him live from Australia. So I'm going to play his um, 
pre-recorded video for you and he's going to explain um, all about his project and importantly how he found the application process um, and any tips that he might have for playing. Hello, my name is Peter Twining and I'm leading the Digital Badges project which was one of the first projects funded by NCFE. I want to tell you a little bit about what we plan to do within the project and then talk a little bit about the application process. So our rationale. Um, we were starting from a, the position of saying we know that assessment drives curriculum and pedagogy. If we want to bring about change in practice uh, within our provision, then we have to change the way we assess students. So that's our starting point. We're working in a context of initial teacher education within Australia, and our students have to demonstrate they've met the Australian professional standards for teachers. At the moment, what happens is our courses are mapped against the standards, and it's assumed that if you've passed a course, then you've met the standards that that course is mapped against. But in practice, if you get 60% on a course, you've clearly met some of the standards probably, but you may not have met some others. Uh, and the mark doesn't really tell you uh, how well you've done against a particular standard or what you need to do next in order to demonstrate you have met all of the standards. So what we're hoping to do, we're aiming to do, uh, was to replace marks with badges. Now the literature tells us that when students are given a mark, they tend to ignore formative feedback. And so what we thought would happen is that if we gave them the badges instead of the marks, they would have to look at the badges to understand how they'd done on the assignment. They'd have to engage with the feedback because the badges are giving them specific feedback about how well they've done against particular standards. So we are hoping that this would empower them in terms of giving them better feedback, but also in helping them to understand about how well they're doing in, in terms of meeting those professional standards for teachers. And we also thought that having one rubric for all of the standards that was used across all the whole program, so all the courses within the teacher education program, would help to ensure consistency um, of interpretation of the standards. Uh, and we thought that it would be really helpful to make sure that the assignments clearly indicated which standards were being addressed within particular assignments. So um, logic tells us that the digital badges will solve many of the problems associated with current forms of assessment, but we really lack evidence about their impact and about how to design and implement them effectively. And that's really the gap that this project was setting out to fill. So we were trying to answer questions like, does using digital badges enhance the quality and consistency of courses? Does it provide formative feedback to students? Does it empower the students by giving them a clearer understanding of the professional standards and how they're doing in relation to them and what they need to do next? Does it increase student agency? And importantly, does it have any negative consequences? Because it's really important in education that you don't just look for the positives, but you also understand that the unintended consequences of things. So what have we planned to do? Well, we're having a, a phased approach, um, starting off with a small course, um, Eduk 1048. Um, this course tends to have a small number of students, and these are students who failed the course in a previous semester. All the students uh, on the teacher education programme have to pass this course to progress to year two. Uh, so the plan was to spend phase one doing all the preparation, getting the ethical clearance, updating the rubrics and basically making sure everything was in place so that we could implement badges within phase two. And then to implement it on this small course with half a dozen, not maybe 20 students. Then in phases three and four, we were going to transfer what we'd learned in phase two to a bigger version of the same course. So intro to ed is effectively the same course as Edge 1048, but it tends to have around a thousand students on it. And so we're hoping that we'll have refined the process sufficiently that we can then run it quite smoothly with a really large number of students. And all the time we're going to be collecting evidence um, about the impacts and the issues with implementation. And then in phases four and uh, five and six, the intention was to provide guidance um, both on design of, of digital badge frameworks and on the implementation of digital badges um, within the education system. Uh, that can be used by other people to help them roll out the use of digital badges in their organisation. And then we were going to recruit, recruit some extra courses uh, within our own programme uh, to extend the use of digital badges and again collect further information about the impacts that they might have. 
So how are we actually going to investigate the impacts? We've got the implementation, we're rolling out the use of badges. How are we going to find out what impacts that they're having? Well, first thing to say is that we're very concerned about ethics. So we're making sure that all the students are having the same experience in terms of them all being given digital badges within the courses that we're using within the pro project. And then a subset of students will provide informed voluntary consent to take part in the research. So they will provide data that helps us to understand what impacts the use of the digital badges has had. The core players here are the core team, so the research team um, who are running the project, the tutors who are teaching courses, and the students who are on the courses. The core team are collecting data on an ongoing basis about their experience of implementing the use of badges and the perceptions they've got about the pros and cons of doing so. The tutors are providing written feedback after every assignment and at the end of course they're taking part in a focus group uh, or an interview uh, to give us a richer picture of what's happening in terms of both the marking of the assignments using digital badges and their perceptions of the students' experience of digital badges and what impacts they're having. The students are filling in a baseline questionnaire that tells us about their previous experience of using digital badges and how they tend to engage with assignment feedback uh, in the past. And then after each assignment, they're doing another questionnaire where, again, they have an opportunity to tell us about how they've engaged with the feedback and their perceptions of the digital badges. And then at the end of the course, a subset of the students take part in focus groups uh, where, again, we get that richer picture of the students' perceptions of the pros and cons of implementing digital badges within the course. And then all of that data is being analysed and the intention is that it's going to help us um, provide guidance on the design of digital badge frameworks, provide guidance on the process of implementing digital badges and provide evidence of the impacts of replacing marks with digital badges. So that was the plan. Um, it's too early to tell you how it's going. We're on schedule to deliver all, all of this, but we haven't yet got the results ready to share. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is talk a bit about the application process. Now, uh, th this is going to feel a bit like teaching you to suck eggs. Uh, the process is actually relatively straightforward and pretty clear, um, but let's go for it. I've added in a stage zero, which is about your idea. And this is about you really sitting down and thinking very clearly about what it is you're wanting to do. What's your purpose? What are your research questions? And how do they align with NCFE's priorities? And importantly, what impacts do you think that they're going to have? And how are you going to evidence those impacts? So that brings us around to the practicalities. The questions about who's going to do what and when and how are they going to do it? And here you need to have a really clear plan, a timeline that shows the actions that are going to be taken. And really importantly, it links back to your research questions. How are you going to collect the evidence that demonstrates that your implementation is having the impacts that you're hoping it's going to have? And importantly, that you're looking for any side effects, any negative impacts that are also taking place. You then need to think about how much it's going to cost. The overall cost and then split that into the cost to you and the cost to NCFE. The cost to you might be in people time, it might be in cash, it might be in uh, intellectual property, but you need to show value for money by showing the contribution you're making that offsets NCFE. And then you need to think about the risks and how they're going to be mitigated. You know, what are you going to do if a key player gets ill? What are you going to do if the software doesn't work? What are you going to do if you can't get into an educational establishment to test your ideas? So then we get to stage one, the application form. And, you know, fill it in. Do what it says on the can. The guidance is really quite clear. And if you've done stage zero, if you're clear about what your project is, what your purposes are, and what your plan is, then the form becomes quite straightforward. Uh, I will really highlight the importance of marking up the draft contract. For me, this was the most challenging and problematic aspect of the whole beast. Uh, so really important you mark up the draft contract and submit it with your application. And if you're unsure of anything, ask NCFE. They're really very supportive and helpful and they want the projects to succeed. And of course, it's really important that you pay attention to the scoring system. This tells you where to focus most of your effort. It tells you what the most important criteria are from NCFE's point of view for you to get through stage one and to get to stage two. And finally, just to end off, I'd say, you know, take the leap, apply, you know, it was a very positive experience for us. And OK, we got funded, but, but 
actually the success rate is higher than on a lot of these builds. So I would really encourage you to give it a go. Thanks and good luck. Right, it's fantastic. I hope that you found that really useful and found it interesting to hear what Peter and his team uh, are up to over in uh, Australia. Apologies for the, at the end there. You might you might have heard the, an Australian rainstorm. Um, so that's what the, the buzzing was in the background. Apologies if that got in the way of you listening. Um, okay, so we're going to um, swiftly move on um, to our second showcase project, and um, I'm going to introduce you to Aftab. Um, and I'm going to allow Aftab to share his screen and tell us about his project. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Aftab Hussain. I'm the Learning Technology Manager at uh, Bolton College. And um, we've, we've had the pleasure of submitting an application to uh, the NCFE for our first pass uh, project. Uh, our first pass platform is designed to uh, support uh, students and teachers with the formative assessment of open-ended questions. And uh, the application process uh, allowed us to scale up the service and uh, implement a pilot work quite extensively with a number of other colleges. So my presentation will provide you with a background uh, into um, the FirstPass platform, the technologies behind it and what we hope to achieve from it. Uh, and also as well, I'll give you a short account of our application process and how that, uh, what that entailed. So but what is FirstPass? So uh, analog machines and computers have been mediated for to assessment now uh, for uh, well over a century. Uh, and uh, computers and uh, have been used to uh, support teachers, typically with closed questioning techniques such as yes/no questions or multiple choice questions. And whilst this method of assessment has been uh, valuable, it, it is quite a na narrow measure of uh, garnering um, a student's understanding about a particular subject topic or, about, or, or the wider subject that they're studying. And the platform, uh, which has been developed by the college seeks to address uh, this by enabling teachers to pose uh, open-ended question to, uh, uh, to their students. So what happens is that the, uh, the, the platform allows the teachers to pose open-ended questions and it allows a computer to analyze the text that's been written on the screen uh, in response to that uh, open-ended question by the teachers. One of the interesting areas that uh, we've been developed as part of the first pass platform is its ability to provide real-time feedback to the students. The ability to provide real-time feedback is important because typically when you go online and you're responding to a free-form text uh, query, query by the teacher, is that it could take a, a few days or a week or more for um, the feedback from your teacher to arrive back at you. And um, what we're hoping to use a real-time feedback for is that can it, uh, a student reflect upon uh, on the work and uh, revise it and reiterate it uh, before they submit it back to the teacher. And the idea is that if we can deliver real-time feedback that's effective, then the, by the time the student submits it to the teacher, it's in a, a reasonable good shape uh, if, um, and, uh, and compared to a computer where no real-time feedback was offered. So that's one of the premises that we are hoping to test during the course of the pilot. The, one of the important things that to note is that um, first pass as, a, uh, as an AI service, as a cognitive uh, computing service, does not uh, overtake or supersede any of the cognitive uh, tasks that are typically undertaken by a teacher uh, when uh, carrying out a formative assessment. So the service should be seen as a, a mediator or a partner uh, in, in the task uh, in, in supporting the uh, student and the teacher in conducting the formative assessment process. And with this in mind, we still think it's crucial that the teacher has final review and commentary on any student work. The computer simply mediates the process. The computer goes nowhere near offering final commentary or, or, or uh, definitely not uh, anywhere near a grade uh, at this early stage in the actual project. So what I want to do now before I go on to the pilot objectives is just to share a, a video that I've got with you. Um, let's see if I can. First Pass has been designed to support students and teachers 
with the formative assessment of open-ended questions. One of the unique features of the FirstPass platform is its ability to offer real-time feedback to students as they compose their answers to open-ended questions. An early iteration of the feedback mechanism has been developed by colleagues at Bolton College. Let's examine how the platform currently delivers feedback to each student. The student needs to click on the assignment heading on the left-hand side of the screen to view the questions that have been posed by his or her teachers. Once a selection is made, the student can see a more detailed view of the open-ended question. The student then clicks on the Edit Submission button to start answering the question. On the right-hand side of the screen, the student can view the elements that need to be covered when answering the open-ended question. The student can also hover over the hint elements to garner more information about what needs to be covered in the answer. Once the student is ready, he or she can start to compose the answer on the screen. As text is entered, FirstPass will start to present real-time feedback to the student. In this early iteration of the feedback panel, the platform highlights the elements that are successfully covered by the student. With regard to this particular question about why people choose to set up as a sole trader, the student starts by stating that some people don't like reporting to others. The feedback panel on the right-hand side of the screen reflects what has been written by the student. As part of the answer, the student also states sole traders are rewarded when they get to keep the profits that they have made running their business. Once again, the feedback panel in the FirstPass platform registers this as a correct response to the question. The student goes on to state that the accounting processes for running a sole trader are easy to manage. Likewise, FirstPass indicates that this is an acceptable response to the question that has been posed by the teacher. If students need further information or guidance as they compose their answers, they can hover over the hint element against each subject topic label. Occasionally, FirstPass may not match the most appropriate subject topic label to a question that has been typed by the student. This can happen if the classifier doesn't have enough training data against that particular subject topic label, or if the training data is not varied enough. But this can be easily addressed, especially if multiple teachers in different education settings help train the subject topic classifier. The feedback panel will also state that occasional sentences may not be recognized by FirstPass and that students should retain that text so that it can be reviewed by teachers when final analysis and commentary on the work is undertaken. When teachers are doing this, they will be given the option to assign a label to these unmatched sentences. Students have the option to save their work and return to it at a later time. They can also highlight individual subject topic labels so that they can make further refinements to their answers. For instance, a student may choose to group certain sentences to improve the composition of the answer. With regard to the elements that make up the feedback panel, colleagues at Bolton College initially wanted to use the panel to indicate if FirstPass had registered the correct subject topic label to each of the sentences in a student answer. Going forward, we envisage that teachers will be able to select from various feedback mechanisms that they could use to support their students. The conversations that we are currently having with students and teachers about the feedback panel look very encouraging and we look forward to introducing a more nuanced set of feedback options to students and teachers. Uh, it gives a, a quite a, a, a nice overview of the, of the FirstPass platform and where we've actually started from. There's a number of technologies that we're using to help teachers and students with formative assessment of open-ended questions. And natural language processing has developed to such a degree nowadays in 2022, where we can teach a computer to analyze freeform text uh, answers that students give to open-ended questions. But we've got to be very clear that the computer does not understand what the computer is right, uh, the student is writing. The computer does not have an appreciation of what the student has said and doesn't understand the context uh, and the subtleties uh, in the language. So, uh, so the, the, the teacher is in the center of all that, but what the computer can do is analyze the freeform text responses and using statistics and uh, probability and Bayesian theorems and what have you, it, it can assess what's been written on the screen and, and give tangible real-time feedback back to the student. So for instance, the computer, by the use of mathematics and statistics, can say, you haven't written about this particular topic or the volume of content uh, about this element of the answer uh, that needs a little bit more work. So, 
the, the actual feedback based on the statistics that the computer uses to analyze a text can be uh, put onto the screen in a tangible way to give effective feedback back to the student. So we never ever say that the computer understands. We never ever say that the word computer reads and understands what you're saying. The computer is just doing a simple set of uh, statistical uh, exercises in order to um, infer some feedback back on the screen to the student. But the actual statistics and the probabilities uh, and, and the Bayesian rules behind the actual uh, program allow the computer to deliver uh, uh, effective real-time feedback back to the student. So the student can say, oh, I haven't written about this topic. I need to write a little bit more. I miss this out. My structure of my, my piece of work is a bit fragmented. I need to uh, lay out the, um, the piece in a more conjoined way and so on. So the feedback is, uh, is very, very important. The feedback doesn't displace the, uh, the teacher altogether. The teacher's still in the loop. Uh, and what, one of the things that we want to stress is that the teacher and the student is never ever superseded. The computer never takes first place. Uh, and th this is a quite a feature of modern AI services where a participatory and collaborative model actually states that the, uh, the, the, the teacher and the students are first and foremost, and the computer simply assists and mediates the entire process on behalf of both of those parties. So what I'll do, I'll carry on to the next bit of the presentation. So the actual objectives of the pilot are, 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 are we've got five objectives altogether. Um, we are going to uh, allow to individual teachers and course teams to train up the subject topic classifiers. So these are containers uh, that allow the computer to uh, analyze the text that's been written by the computer as he or she en uh, enters an answer against an open-ended question on the screen. So, and we're also going to be using crowdsourcing to allow that to, to take place. This is an interesting feature whereby I could be in Bolton in Manchester here in the northwest of England, but uh, you guys could be in Glasgow or, or Aberdeen or Edinburgh, and uh, you could also uh, uh, support the training of the subject topic classifiers on the platform, even though we're geographically dispersed and in different institutions. So potentially you could be anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world and assist the AI uh, first pass platform to uh, uh, support the, uh, the analysis of free form text answers from the students. This is quite uh, powerful because as more and more students uh, um, uh, respond to the uh, open-ended question, as more and more responses are garnered from the students and the teachers across the UK and further afield, the classifiers become more refined uh, and more accurate in responding and analyzing the uh, free form text responses. So if you've got a question like a history paper and that's been posed to the students in Bolton, and then you've got another 10,000, 100,000 students across the UK who are also responding to that history paper, then the first pass platform becomes incredibly uh, uh, reliable and effective at assessing the, the piece of work against that history topic. We're also going to be uh, using uh, and hiring data labels in the, uh, as part of the project. And we've already started to hire data labelers to uh, support it. The reason for uh, hiring uh, data labelers who are subject specialists and vocational experts is that it, it will um, help us assess whether or not we ask volunteer teachers uh, and practitioners to help us uh, crowdsource the uh, classifiers on the, uh, on the platform. Or as some academics will say is that the, the motivation and the um, engagement with the platform tends to drop off if there's no monetary reward for the person who's um, who, who's labeling up the platform. So one of the things that we're assessing is, is retention higher for volunteers or is retention higher for paid uh, for subject experts who act as data labels on the platform. And one of the things that we want to see is if data labels prove to be more effective, what's the business model that, that we need to adopt in order for these to sustain the use and the support of the data labels out there. And we're also going to assess different feedback mechanisms on the platform. Um, feedback mechanisms on the platform can change and alter, and we're allowing the teachers to select different effective feedback tools that, that we have. So uh, as part of the pilot, we'll assess the effectiveness of different feedback tools on the screen that, that help the students compose his or answers before they submit it back to the teacher. And also um, the final bit is, uh, a small exercise on 
how first pass supports, uh, supports the preparation for endpoint assessments. So teachers typically will give out mock exam papers with open-ended questions, but there's a burden on the teacher when doing that because he or she's got to mark the scripts in quick time uh, to give it back to the students, provide the feedback, identify any gaps in knowledge, and cover those all over again and again and again until the endpoint assessment takes place. So one of the tests that we're going to do uh, is, does first pass uh, enable um, students to better prepare for endpoint assessments if they're getting real-time feedback at home uh, away from the teacher? In the, when we applied for the actual uh, um, assessment innovation fund, well, one of the things that uh, we stressed was um, identify the gap in knowledge. So there's lots of products and services out there to support assessment. But uh, one of the features that, uh, one of the questions that the uh, NCFE ask is, what is the gap in knowledge that you're trying to address? Uh, are, are you simply regurgitating uh, prior knowledge or reshaping it and reformulating it and posing a new trial or pilot with the NCFE funding? Or have you actually identified a true gap in knowledge uh, that, that, does, that um, isn't answered yet uh, by practitioners across the education sector and by practitioners in the edtech sector. So identifying that gap is a, a, a must for uh, any, any applicant to the fund because it does add credibility and add some weight to your application if you've identified a huge gap in knowledge in, in your proposal. One of the things that we've learned is that uh, when we're submitting the proposal, we're going to be very concise uh, uh, in our use of language. And uh, without that, uh, without being able, to, being able to be concise, you're unable to actually um, um, propose a, um, a solution or a proposal to the NCFE as part of its funding program. Uh, and we feel that having more and more internal conversations in your team to wider audiences allows you to be more concise and more um, uh, um, animated about what you're saying. And the more conversation you have internally within your own organization, before you submit it, will help you with your application process. And we've also discovered that as part of our application process, uh, working with other stakeholders is a strength. And I know amongst the colleges and universities in Scotland, you've already got a, a very collaborative approach in the way you work and the, uh, the way you adopt new technologies. But we've also learned from yourselves in the sense that we work with uh, broad stakeholders in strengthening our proposal. So for instance, we got the help of IBM Research in the UK, who are supporting us in the background. But also, we said that's part of the pilot. We wouldn't just do one in, uh, at Bolton, but we would actually seek out the support uh, and the help from other colleges who are taking part in the pilot. And we've got a number of colleges now who are signed up to the pilot to support us with this. And we think that uh, wider stakeholder engagement actually strengthens our final proposal. And above all, um, don't be scared about being bold and daring in your work. Um, the, the NCFE we've discovered is willing to take risks on projects that are risky. And was, uh, the uh, first pass project is, uh, falls into that class of risky projects. We simply don't know if it will work at scale across multiple institutions uh, with hundreds and thousands of students around the UK. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of teachers who are potentially going to be using this as to, uh, as time goes by. So it's quite a, an interesting one. And uh, that kind of concludes my presentation. Yeah, Colin, thank you after, for that. It's a, um, really fascinating work that you're doing. Um, and we're just, yeah, we're, we're really pleased that you applied for our fund and, and, uh, and that we're part of it as well. So yeah, thank you, thank thank you, you. that was really useful. And there's gonna be a chance to ask after um, some questions um, very soon, but not before we've heard, we've heard from Rebecca and Nikki at Calderdale, and then we'll have a little bit of a, a Q and A section for, for for the three of them. If you if you've got any questions, um, so uh, over to you, Rebecca and Nikki. Um, feel free to share your screen and um, tell us about your project. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm Rebecca Weeks. I'm the project manager for this particular pilot project. This is Nicola Hudson. Hi, I'm Nikki Hudson. I'm the Head of Employer Services at Coldale College and uh, I'm responsible on in this project really for the stakeholder, partner and employer engagement. 
Um, one of the things that we wanted to mention first and foremost is the fact that we've actually got um, an internal project team for this particular pilot and also an extensive wider project team and an extensive um, stakeholder and network. Um, stakeholder network, stakeholders and partners um, network. Um, and we've got some um, four professionals working for us, um, some with um, in kind for a knowledge share basis and some with actual um, monetary um, remuner remuneration. Um, so I'll just keep moving on and then I'll weave the wider project team in as we go. So our research hypothesis is I'll read this out. Learners who assess, access the use of uh, virtual or augmented reality and simulated experience as part of curriculum delivery and assessment will be better prepared to enter the workplace or progress further in education. The rationale for this particular scenario um, was basically, we were looking at the fact that in higher education, um, the standard of teaching in higher education is a, it can be deemed to be a lot higher, mainly because of the actual technical equipment and the resources which are available to students. And also within CPD, um, within the workforce as well, simulated experience, augmented virtual and X reality, that is all pretty standard in health. But in social care and within FE, it's just not common practice. There are a few FE providers that might have a simulation centre, but normally that is because of a, an affiliation with um, a teaching hospital or with a university, not as a standalone. Um, we decided to look at the use of immersive technologies in assessing the care certificate standards, and that was based on conversations that we'd had with employers and with um, Skills for Care and Health Education England on the fact that the care certificate standard needs to be delivered and assessed by employers only. Um, our employers told us that that's approximately a thousand pound per person that to put them through the care certificate standard and assess them. So we thought if there's anything that we can do within a, um, FE to minimize the cost to the employer, obviously that's going to be a, a really beneficial thing. And also who assesses the assessor, you know, employers, are they, are they the correct people to actually be conducting an assessment um, when it's a standard and it's based on competencies? So we're looking at that. Um, and then we thought that this would actually help with recruitment and retention a lot because there's quite a lot of high churn, obviously, in social care. There's a lot of churn within FE with people starting courses then working through and then finding out actually it's probably not the right course for me going into employment and going actually this isn't the right um career path for me so the more we can do within fe the better one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did within this particular um pilot is to look at um how we can actually work together within the curriculum areas because we're using and um, we're using virtual reality now, because we're using virtual reality, what we thought would be a really good thing to do was to see whether or not our digital T level and networking um, and digital T level and the networking T level students in year two who are exceedingly proficient and who already work have um, worked on projects with employers such as Lloyds Banking Group and Conveyor Insurance, if they would be able to develop the actual virtual reality scenario for us. Um, working with employers, working with Anne Sunderland, who's an industry expert, and she works at Oxford Medical Simulations Group, and then obviously liaising with our health and social care staff and students. What's important to remember is that when this particular pilot project isn't going to be dissecting and researching the, the use of cross-curricular cross working, it was just like an added value, it's an added bonus for this particular pilot. Um, none of this pilot could ever have come to fruition if it weren't for the collaboration that we have with our employers and our stakeholders. It's been what, since 2017, 16, 17, discussions have been ongoing um, about how FE can up its game, um, can service employers better, can service and work with stakeholders better. I'll come into that in a little while. And then obviously this fits and aligns beautifully with the FE Skills White Paper. 
So all of this was our rationale for the solution. This was all of our starting point. We then wanted to look at the impact for the learner. Um, obviously working with and having access to a simulation center which is being gifted to us free of charge, which is brilliant by one of our key partners, and that is Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. Um, we've got access to their professional simulation suite. Um, to, have a, to, to, to give students the, the ability to go into the workplace, number one, not actually still remain on campus, but go into the workplace, to be able to give them access to the technology that surgeons use, that um, the healthcare assistants use, and to be able to give them access to the virtual reality and virtual scenario settings and environs. Absolutely will build engagement and agency purely by virtue of being immersed in real life, hands-on technical experience, working with real life um, experts in their field, we wanted to create opportunities for learners to be reflective. And one of the things that we absolutely adore about the simulation um, setting, especially in the professional environment, is the fact um, of the feedback and the debrief sessions. So a student, a learner can go through their um, scenario with the mannequin and it's a high fidelity mannequin. So it's one of those all singing, all dancing, it blinks, um, it oozes. Um, it talks, um, it, it, it's a replica of a human being. Um, they go through their scenario, then what will happen is, as they're doing that, their peers will be able to watch them on screen in a different room, and then they come together at the end to reflect and to be assessed, and the employers are also going to be part of that um, situation as well, which is brilliant. I'm not going to read out everything that's on these slides because we're going to circulate them afterwards so you can see what we believe um, are the benefits and the impact for the learners. Like I said, the collaboration with employers and peers um, to develop all of these scenario stories is absolutely critical because we need to make them as real life as possible. So what we're going to do for the virtual reality um, situation is we're going to gamify it. So when the user puts on their um, headset, the first time they encounter the scenario, which will have been built with the employers and built with Anne Sunderland um, to make it a real life scenario, um, it gets progressively harder each time they go in and practice their skill set. So when they become to the assessment points, the three assessment points throughout the academic year, we can actually start to track and measure the impact of them using the simulation center and also the um, headsets. It's about replicating a real working life environment. One of the key reasons why Skills for Care believe that um, it's the, up to the employer and the employer is the correct person to be signing off the competencies of the care certificate standard um, is because it's not all of the standards can work unless you've got a physical person there. So we understand that. We understand that the majority of the care certificate standards is knowledge based. So it's things like standards, if you aren't aware, things like um, risk assessment, it's um, manual handling, prevention of um, infectious diseases, et cetera, et cetera, and GDPR. Um, we understand that sometimes you need a physical person there because that's real, that is proper real life. But if we can do as much as possible um, before they get out into the working environment or the learner then progresses, into um, further education, the better. It's about testing skills and it's about measuring behaviours. The reason that we've um, plumped for um, the Oculus MetaQuest 2, and this is a real quick turnaround change. Originally, in our first application, it was, uh, it was virtual reality. Then we were informed by one of another one of our key partners, NHS Digital, the immersive technologies team, that it would be um, HoloLens is what we need to go down and virtual reality. Then when we met with another one of our partners only last week, um, the Centre for Immersive Technologies, which is a collaboration and a, becoming a centre of excellence for um, with um, University of 
Leeds and Bradford Teaching Hospitals, they said, no, 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 you want to be using the Oculus MetaQuest 2s, go back to virtual reality, because that will service your, um, what you're trying to do much better, it's a much better fit. Um, one thing to mention is that our students on the T-level um, digital and networking um, courses, they're very proficient already in working and in agile. And they've got pragmatic waterfall, but they actually work already in agile. And so they're used to working with a scrum master. They're used to sprint planning, et cetera. So this project fits with their second year project, which is great. Um, the care certificate standards have been embedded within our core curriculum delivery now. So again, nothing of this is outside or now above and beyond what is already being taught. This is all now thoroughly embedded within the core curriculum. Project timeline has shifted a wee bit and I'll come into the reasons to why that has been um, when I talk about our application process. Um, but as you can see, we've got a very distinct defined stage, delivery stage and reporting stage. Um, it's all based in our academic year. It all has to align with our core curriculum um, and delivery, and therefore it has to actually work in harmony with what our students have to um, learn and pass as part of their core curriculum. So as you can probably imagine, it's, it's a very, very complex um, and multifaceted pilot. Um, but the beauty is that we've got a really strong partner and stakeholder relationship and collaboration and with employers as well, which is great. The research and the research methodology, which I'll come and talk to in more detail um, a little bit later with about our application process. Um, we're very lucky in the fact that we've managed to negotiate with the University of Huddersfield and Professor Nigel King, um, who was actually was the one that I'm not a research person, so please, 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 please give me some sway when I say I, he developed, I presume he developed, Tempe Analysis, um, has written many a book on it now, and it is now a, um, a research methodology used um, with by researchers and um, academics. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to move on to the next research, uh, the, the next um, project journey and the application journey, because all of this fits together. So for our project journey, as you can see, and as I mentioned, 2016-17, we started working with Health Education England on a project looking at building a digital ready workforce and the digitalization of the social care employers. 2018, Care 21, which was a program um, delivered by Nikki um, and Health Education England, looking at skills, knowledge, attributes, and the qualifications and linking to curriculum worked extensively with employers on that one. Um, 2019, an ESF funded project called Let's Talk Real Skills brought all of the above into one cohesive package and broadened the conversations with um, the key strategic partners. Um, and it really solidified um, the building blocks as to where we are now and the reason why we're doing what we're doing with this pilot. Um, and then throughout 2021 was the scoping of this project with, pilot, with employers and partners. Our application journey is that we failed. We failed our first attempt under round two. And I'll come in to talk to you about why that was in a minute. Um, and then we, we were successful upon round three. So on our second um, application. One of the key things that um, I want to talk about is the fact that we had a really good solid project proposal, but we're FE. We're not university, we don't do research, we don't talk academic research. And so the research and the research methodology was one of the key reasons as to why we failed in our first one. So here under 2001, we lacked the detail and understanding of a research project. We, sh we started with the beginning. So we started with all of this top, what was our project journey? We started with all of that, but what we should have done is absolutely start with the research because this is about research funding and understood more about research methodologies and about what, how you actually um, develop 
and timeline a project to um, come up with a research paper, basically, or to understand what even the project is. Is it an impact study? Is it um, a feasibility study? What is it? What is this project? Um, so really, our conclusion and advice, because I don't want to keep us on for too much longer, uh, our conclusion and advice would be very much Number one, understand what research means. <laughs> what are the different research methodologies? What is a feasibility impact study? How does your project fit with that? What are you, what do you need to tweak your aims in order to be able to um, look at the, the research element of it? Speak to as many experts as possible before submitting your application. Cannot advise you to do that as much as possible mainly and simply because a it's already been mentioned but it bolsters your application but also because these are pilots these are movable feasts so for example we started with AR we went to and sorry we started with VR we then were told to go to AR now we're back doing VR it's a movable feast things move all the time one of the other things I'm just going to flick back to the other screen that we discovered whilst talking with um, the University of Leeds and the, um, the Centre for Innovation, um, no, the Centre for Immersive Technologies, was this down here, the bottom under number three, was the, the research, we actually needed to include three degrees of validity. Didn't know what they were until last week. We now know what they are. So we're weaving those into um, our um, project and our outcomes and the research piece. Um, we believe that the research hypothesis and your methodology is your starting point. Work back from there. Um, scalability as well is absolutely crucial and absolutely key. We had a really good solid project proposal, but we needed to look, go back to the drawing board and look at how this could be scaled. Yes, this project could fund us. Yes, it could purchase the headsets, but FE doesn't have that amount of money in reality. So how can this be scaled for wider um, FE colleges? How can it be scaled into other subject areas? Um, how can other colleges have access to um, simulation centers, for example? We're lucky because we've spent a good long two years building up relationships, building up trust and confidence with key partners, which is why we've been able to access what we've accessed for free. How does that work um, outside of this project and for other people? Um, so one of the key things that what we're doing is that we're sharing and we're going to make um, freely available absolutely everything that we do. So our um, digi team and our networkers are going to put up onto GitHub um, and open source all of the coding that they develop. Um, we're also one thing I meant to mention is that we're also working with um, a tech, a digital tech specialist to help us in case there are any what I deem as technical blockers. Um, so if our students and our staff are unsure of where to go in the developing of the scenarios, then we've got the industry experts there to help them and to support them. And that's the one that um, Focus MRS, that's what their role is within this project, this pilot. But we've also then got the backup of another um, um, expert, technical expert company, Taran 3G, and also both universities, Huddersfield and Leeds University, have experts within their universities and with even within their health and social care um, schools to be able to fall back on. All, it's all about your risk mitigation. Always think of, okay, if that doesn't work, what else can we do? If that doesn't work, what else can we do? Where can we go? Put all of your building blocks in place. Be realistic, don't be overly ambitious, keep it simple. This is a pilot for us. Um, Nikki will testify, I tend to get carried away somewhere. That's why I haven't been able to speak yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can get slightly carried away. And um, world peace, world domination, etc. work out everything in one year. Um, so be realistic, don't be over ambitious, keep it simple. But yes, definitely take risks, you know, absolutely. This is a pilot. That's what pilot funding is for. Um, but, but remember what your limitations are, basically. 
And just remember that this is a pilot project, it's funded, so it definitely needs to deliver measurable results. So what we're doing is we're not only um, asking the University of Huddersfield to undertake the research for us and hopefully have come out with a, a published research paper, um, but also we internally are going to produce a find recommendations and findings and recommendations report um, and our um, evaluation team are going to be speaking with employers much in much more depth and much more detail about how did they find it, um, what worked, what didn't, which is much more looking at that the pr processes and the procedures, etc. And did we hit the aims and the objectives, not just the research hypothesis. Um, I am going to stop. Is there anything, Nikki? No, I think you said it. I, th I think the, what we found is since we've been awarded the funding and we started talking to more and more people, it's actually snowballed. And yeah. it's a bit like we need to sometimes we need to rein ourselves in a little bit. I think actually we, we, we've been we've been funded to deliver this but we can see that actually there is a great deal of interest in it and there's probably got some legs to do more yeah but we're obviously at the minute we're focusing on what we've been yeah asked to do yeah this is all part of the scalability we think and we feel so what we're going to do is we're going to develop and um, implement a working group um a partners and stakeholders working group to look at where can this go next um, how can we widen this pilot to make it a much bigger impact study, as is very much a feasibility study at this stage? What is the impact? What, where can we go to, to, to conduct an impact study? What does that look like in research language um, and in, within a research piece? Um, and then take it from there. We can't look at this as just in isolation because it's not. It's the starting point of something much bigger. And we also want to be able to use the findings. Well, the assumption is that we'll be able to use the findings to lobby the DFE to say, actually, you need to start funding um, FE much better in order for us to be able to have things and resources like a simulation centre, even if it's jointly between different colleges. And then also go to Health Education England and lobby them to say to them, you need to fund us in the exact same way that you fund higher education, because at the moment they just don't. Social care needs the funding, FE needs the funding, and the employers will then benefit, as will the students. Um, I'll put my soapbox away now <laughs> and stop sharing if I can work out how to do that there it is <laughs> thank you thanks both of you um again it's really interesting detail about your project and th thank you for um uh, uh, telling everyone about your first go and the, the fact they didn't work out and you came back I think that's really kind of useful and um very, very noble of you um so we're going to pause um, in the presentations just for a few minutes now. Um, if there's anybody that wants to ask a question, either in the chat or come off mute and ask a question to Aftab, Rebecca or Nikki um, about either about their project or about the process of applying for funding um, for NTFE, then now's your time to do it. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, yes, yeah, Stephen, please do come. Off, uh, off, off mute and ask a question. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. I mean, the, the content you've just come across with is actually really awe inspiring. You know, some of the stuff you've been talking about, especially in the AR and the VR world, which are, you know, my heavily focused on. Um, question to ask the people here, probably Rebecca uh, from Caldecott and everything, is how much time do you spend on the paperwork? And let me explain my rationale for that. I think currently we're looking at the project serve pilot about 25k. When I looked at the paperwork, and, and again, I'm in FE as well, so I understand totally what you've been saying there. We really, you know, and 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 what's worrying me is you 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 were successful because you put the research first. Now, to me, it's practical application and rollout with the learners, which is what I'm going to be focusing on. I don't want to put a lot of time into the paperwork to find that it is research based, that this is where it's all going. And I could write a paper on it or I could do all this, which I've done in the past. I don't want to do that. I want to show the practical application of it because NCFE courses we deliver here. I want to show the benefits to them and the learners, not to write a paper about it. I want to show the practical application of digital in their curriculum areas, not write a paper and a thesis on it. 
I'd rather look at other funding if that's so that kind of question how long does it take and also from an NCFE perspective after a follow-on from that is are your your funding applications going to be more favorably fit for curriculum areas which we are delivering NCFE in or is it across the board if I come in first then for you Gray um okay. Yeah, go that's the reason we got the University of Huddersfield to do the research paper um it's not our bread and butter I yeah. I, I swear to Mother Mary Steve mm. sitting down and speaking with a with a, a, a 40 years in the industry academic research yeah. academic I have now learned so I, it's great you know I've learned yeah an immense amount. I mean, the three degrees of validity that I suddenly just yeah. discovered last week, um, it's been brilliant. Yeah. Um, so what I would possibly recommend is look to other partners, get mm -hmm. partners in to do things like that. All you have to remember to do is to timeline it in your project timeline. So we're looking at the key assessment points. Obviously you'll have your baseline, your, your first point, your second point assessment, endpoint assessment. We're weaving all of this in around those particular points. So it minimizes the impact. We didn't want us, we don't want our staff, as you will appreciate, who are up to here as it is anyway, having to do any more than their day job. Yeah. The biggest element for us and the biggest front end piece of work was um, mapping across the care certificate standards and seeing where within the, 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 the curriculum, we're using the um, CERT prep level three and T levels and the transition groups. Yeah. Um, so just to give you the context there. Um, so that was the biggest part to do was all the mapping across as to where it fitted, where each of the standards fit within, and then how we can actually then um, demonstrate those competencies at those points. Um, but yeah. apart from that, yeah, absolutely. No, it's not our bread and butter. I'm not the expert. FE yeah. is not the expert in, in, in feasibility studies and research. Go out, I am sure one of your local universities, I don't know where you are, would have somebody who can use it as their project, one of their right. projects. Yeah, thanks that, for that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I think if anything else, and I don't go any further, Rebecca, we need to talk about what you've been doing because I'd love yeah. to see how we can incorporate into our college. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that, Rebecca and Steve. Steve, I'll just give you um, a, li a little um, addition to that. Um, mm -hmm. The the fund is the, the the purpose of the fund is to really. Um, Provide, provide an opportunity for people to test out their idea with learners. So it's definitely a, or, or, or with teachers or whatever, whatever the end user is. Um, it's definitely not an academic desk-based research fund. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think the, the, the point that uh, Rebecca and Nikki were making in the presentation is we do want to, to we, we do want to build a really good evidence base. So when you are, testing out your idea with learners or teachers or whoever you need to think about a research framework that will um that will provide a really good evidence base so you need to think about you know can i can i put a control group in here um can i use a really good research design um that will um stand up to scrutiny those kind of things so we're not we're not hoping expecting people will only get a research paper out of this that might come mm -hmm. out of it but what we want is um ideas and solutions that have been really well road tested and, and impact tested with learners and, and teachers yeah. um so hopefully that kind of gets to the research bit um your other question was about ncfe w whether we would look more favorably on something that's focused on ncfe products the answer is definitely not um and it goes back to what i was saying right at the beginning the the fund is furthering our charitable purpose not our commercial purpose Right. So please don't, you know, if, if, it, if it's an NCFE qualification, then great, you know, that that's obviously fine, but please don't kind of make, please don't try and shoehorn something in that's it's an NCFE qual if it's not the right one, um, yeah. that, that won't, you know, that, that's, that's not necessary at all. I think, I think where I am is the, the, the areas that we deliver for the NCFE here do fit and that was my initial thought when as soon as i mm -hmm. see the fund come up that well this would work in you know in 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 our uh, public services and crime scene and things like that you know that's the kind of area i was looking into and it's a course we deliver 
for NCFE. So, you know, okay. but mentioning that in there, that's that probably would be beneficial as well to say, you know, just as a, uh, you know, a, a, as an additional line. Yeah. Okay. Like some... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely mention it. It's, it's part of the detail, but it, it um, yeah, that, that, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Ray, okay, sorry, can I just say Steve. one really quick thing? Sorry. Use your, everybody, use your NCFE points of contact. NCFE are brilliant. They are so lovely about looking at your application and doing quick feedback with you. They're really, really lovely and they're really open and they're really approachable. This isn't one of those funding streams where you're on your own <laughs> and the funders like in over there somewhere and you're well over there. It's not, they're not like that at all. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Bigging up Dean, because I know you did a lot of work with Dean uh, in, in your pre-application phase. Um, John, I'm not sure. Please, please feel free to come off mute, John, and ask your question. Um, I'm not sure if it's for directed at Rebecca, at Nikki and Aftab, or whether it's for Dean and I, but please go ahead and ask it. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's really directed at the NCFE, really, just to give you a bit of... So this is the question. It's really about community education for adult literacy which is what we're involved in we're a, a little um, non-profit company uh, mm -hmm. that's been developing uh, apps and things like that mm -hmm. um, and i've kind of prepared a wee text so i'm don't take too long to speak about it so citizen literacy is a non-profit company focusing on improving adult literacy skills and we're using a mixture of tech analytics and good old print resources plus learning design to help tutors, to help adults uh, improve their literacy, reading and writing skills, uh, mostly in community education settings. It's not a particularly FE focus, although some of our tutors that we work with are in a FE college setting doing community education, but that tends to be at the edges of colleges um, as well. Uh, and we've got a lot of interest from council community education folks here and actually elsewhere like australia for instance um, and we're we're filling a gap that exists for adult literacy we think so we're trying to reach some of the hardest to reach learners and their tutors and one of the things we've got an idea about in regard to this um, fund is bringing those learners and their tutors who tend to be on the edge of mainstream education and qualifications into a, a, a path that could possibly take them into an NCFE functional skills assessment because for these learners this may be the first actual real in inverted commas qualification that they've ever had and this could make a big difference it could also help go towards um, solving some of the skills crisis that we've got in retail, uh, social care, hospitality and construction, where most of these adults are actually working at the moment, but uh, can't progress. So I guess what I'm saying is, would the NCFE be interested in us working with community education tutors to test our platform in regards to bringing, preparing tutors for functional skills assessment, probably NCFE ones, because colleagues have actually worked with NCFE and had updating your functional skills qualifications. What we'd be interested in is building a road path to bring the formal assessment all the way up to, you know, entering higher beyond functional skills anyway that's the end of my question thanks thanks john um it, it sounds like a really great so it sounds like great work that you're doing um we're definitely interested in and well we're interested in any area of the education system so that absolutely uh, extends to your kind of community community education area um as i was saying to steve the whether or not a that this isn't a commercial thing for us. So whether or not you're leading learners towards NCFE functional skills, other functional skills 
products other English or mass products you know then that, that's wh whatever's appropriate is is the right thing not not that it's NTFE um so yeah that sounds really interesting um I, I guess one thing I would say is remember it's an assessment innovation fund so just make sure that your um that your solution is focused on an aspect of assessment and obviously it can be assessment for learning so and, and very much intertwined um but as, as part of that journey but yeah I, I think the answer is definitely yes okay that's good thanks um kenji I've, uh you've got your hand up um uh, yes, Hello. I do. I I I, I apologise. Um, <clears throat> since obviously uh, <laughs> we invited you to <laughs> produce this webinar for us up here in Scotland, um, so I, if anyone else has a question, please interrupt me. Um, I was just interested in a couple of points, really. Um, one one is obviously in Scotland we have less access to NCFE uh, qualifications, um, so I just want to stress your point about this being open. To, to all educational institutions and pathways uh, as an opportunity to apply for the funding. There was a comment from, I think, um, Rebecca Calderdale talking about the output of their content was being made available via GitHub. Um, so presumably under an open source license and then freely available to others. So I'm just asking about the restrictions uh, connected with the output and outcomes of this work that is being funded are there any particular ties to ncfe uh, considerations that people should have before applying to this um, just in terms of what the work that they're producing so no there are there aren't restrictions um i think the the default terms and conditions talk about um talk about ncfe owning foreground ip from my project so that might be analysis insight reporting you know that kind of thing um, um but we will be making that available anyway on our uh, assessment innovation fund website so that so, so projects that um that get our grant funding will be reported on publicly um and so, so i don't really think there are any restrictions kenji that anyone needs to be concerned about i guess we do have some conversations with people who are developing new tech within a project and we do we do talk to them about ip and 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 we're really open to negotiate um whether you know whether that shouldn't shouldn't reside in ncfe for lots of really good reasons often it's built into a lot of previous work and therefore actually separating doesn't make any sense anyway so no i don't think people need to worry about that we're really open um and hope we're, we're hoping to advance the sector, not advance NCFE with this fund. It's, it's, like I said, it's part of our charitable purpose. And um, Re Rebecca has her hand up, so I <laughs> just interrupting just a slight, slightly uh, more in terms of so research has been talked about in terms of um, the application process. Uh, obviously, co-working with a university in Calderdale's case, um, AFTAB. I'm sure has a, a, a huge background around research, but in terms of how much weight do you put in to that formal aspect of the research? So typically in Scotland, uh, for colleges here, I'm sure us, uh, CDN, would help with any aspects of if they needed help with forming uh, an action research proposal as part of this. What, How much does that play into um, the application and the success, would you say? Um, it, it definitely does play into it because um, what we don't want to do is put money into an idea that um, that might be really good, but the but the project can't provide the evidence base to say to to to, to sort of persuade people in the sector that this is a, this is a great idea and it could work and it could have impact. So, so just, it is, it, sorry, it is sorry. important. Just, just from that then, so because we, we saw the presentation today from, from Peter, um, based at the university, and also Calderdale, with the help with the University of Huddersfield. Would you say then an application is better served if there is collaboration with a university or more weight is given? Or is it a question of as long as they can cover the evidence base with some formal action research with the evidence base to support that, then that would be sufficient? What advice would you give? And yeah, I, I interested think the latter, to hear aftabs. 
point of view too. Your, your latter your latter point is absolutely sufficient. And we do find that people do often partner with the university. Um, I don't know, probably about, I'm, I'm just thinking maybe three or four off the top of my head of our eight live projects have a university partner. Um, definitely three that I can think of. So, um, so yeah, it does, it does seem to be an effective way to do it, but it's not obviously the only way um, to do it. So it's not a must by any means. I'm just going to um, I'm just going to stop us there if that's all right because um, we wanted to to share with you a bit more detail about how to apply in the current window. Um, I think that's probably the best place to finish off. Um, so Dean is going to tell us about that. Dean, I'm hoping you can um, fit in your um, slides into five minutes, even though we gave you ten. To see how you do. I like the challenge. To be fair, Gray, um, it's great to see everyone as well. Um, some great questions there as well. Um, just before I start going through um, sort of the, the intricacies, I guess, of the window, um, what I would say as well is we are running workshops as part of this round. Um, we had our first workshop yesterday, had about 25 people in attendance. It's, it's a great opportunity to come and ask a lot of those questions. And we've generally got a, a small sort of breakout session as well, where typically we try and have five, six people in one room um, where it is possible to really go into some detail um, with regards to the specifics as well um it's, it's quite hard sometimes with the guidance because each project's so different um, and we are quite broad in terms of what we're what we're looking for um but just as a high level overview of the fund um we do have a current window open so that opened on the 22nd of august um as part of this sort of round uh, previous rounds we've had three windows up to this point that i know becca um, and peter talked about before um, we're actually funding projects up to £25,000 for this window um, with further windows in spring planned for another £25,000 um, as well as a larger £100,000 pot. Um, part of the reason why we've done that is to try and split, I guess, project ideas. We've got a lot of people that have applied in the past who maybe have a bit more of a, um, an acorn of an idea where it's just the start of something. Um, and obviously with this type of work, often you can't sort of really fresh out any details until you get started. Um, and that definitely came through. And a lot of the advice we've had from the applicants um, was around that actually, as you involve more stakeholders, as you get more into the detail, you uncover more things about the project. Um, so th this initial pot of funding could be used for activities such as that, really exploring it in more detail with the idea of the larger pot possibly being used for a large efficacy study um, or, or, or I guess a lot of trials with learners there um, and hopefully that'll form a I guess a, a bit of a ladder approach where you know it provides that opportunity of applying for more funding um, at a later point. Um, in terms of just some basics of, of what we look for um, who can apply we are uh, very broad in that sense you know great did a great job before covering off it's not just NCFE qualifications the fund operates both nationally and internationally um, NCFE's core purpose as a charity is to promote and advance learning. Um, that you know, there's so many beneficiaries of that, um, and ultimately we serve the learner um, in whatever context that that learner is working in. Um, we've got obviously a, a lot of the applicants we've had previously fall within some of the bullets on that screen there, um, but definitely you know it, it could really be any organisations, um, and we're also open to collaborative bids too. If there's you know. I guess the universities is a great example of that, um, but perhaps actually it's a, a college or um, some sort of provider that's got a tech contact. That, that, that's another, I guess, example. Um, the only people we would probably exclude from this is individuals, just because, again, coming to that scalability aspect, coming to that risk, I guess, of being able to deliver the project, and um, we do look for organisation uh, level. In terms of this specific window, what we're looking for, and I've just popped on the learner value chain, that grey reference before, very, very interested in all areas of this, um, and particularly the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, what we found with projects so far is they typically fall within the summit of and the on-program phase. Um, so what we are really interested in hearing about within this window is um, pilots that, that might be around progression, pre-program um, or onboarding. Now, that's not to say we'll not fund projects if they are in the form of our summit of space. Um, what we're asking really is, is often with ideas, um, they can be applied to multiple zones. Um, and I guess this is just a, an opportunity there to say, you know, if you have got an idea that actually relates 
somewhat the progression, then absolutely we look favourably upon that um, when evaluating the applications there. Um, we've got a whole host of, of content on our website and for the purpose of time, I'll not read all these out, um, but we've got lots of advice and guidance, I'd say what uh, assessment areas that we're focused on there. Um, and what we would say is the idea or innovation needs to align to at least one of these, could align the modern one, um, it's more than likely that it does. But what we look for is that stress um, for you to I guess elaborate on that within your application. Um, some specific dates for you, um, and we'll, we'll circulate these afterwards, but um, we're looking for a close on the 3rd of October at 9am for the expression of interest. We have split the application form this time, so some of the feedback from um, applicants such as Becca, Aftab, Peter has been that we are quite in depth in terms of what we asked for up front. Um, so what we've done is we split it out into a two-part process where the first part really concentrates on what your idea is. What is the innovation? What are sort of, I guess, the long-term aspirations of that, um, as well as providing details in terms of what context or problem area you're working with. Um, so that's initially what the expression of interest focuses on. Um, from that, we'll invite applicants to, I guess, apply for stage one in the week beginning the 10th of October, following some initial evaluation. Um, at that point, that's when we look at the project specifics. So how are you going to deliver this? Um, what sort of project plan have you got? Um, I guess, what does a research methodology look like in detail? Um, and you get a, a period of about a month there to, I guess, provide a first proposal on that. I mean, it's important to note at this stage as well, a lot of projects are iterative. Um, there's changes all the time. Um, back, back, um, <laughs> last week, that, that, that was obviously a great example of a change. Um, and we do work uh, quite closely with uh, applicants um, to, 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 I guess, work with those and, and you'll get a pilot partner um, in, in the form of myself or Gray to support you with that process. Um, for this window, we're looking for final decisions end of November. Um, and that likely means in terms of timelines that we're looking at, say, a January start. Although we don't, again, have any hard, I guess, timeframes in terms of when they need to start or how long projects actually need to run for for this particular window. Um, I'm going to leave it there, Gray, just because I'm conscious of time. Um, we do have more, but as I say, uh, I'd I'd, I'd recommend anyone coming along to one of the workshops that we're hosting to find out a little bit more there. Thanks, Dean, for that. So um, let's leave it at that. The, the next AIF workshop that we're putting on for potential participants is a week today on the 20th, uh, and that's an opportunity to hear a, a lot more about the application process. Um, so both the expression of interest stage and stage one following that. Um, and a chance to talk to us about your ideas, um, and uh, we can we can um, we can discuss, uh, you know, um, how those ideas might land with our expert panel. So um, I think we're going to wrap up there. Thanks uh, to Aftab, Rebecca, Nikki, and Dean for coming and talking to us, telling us all about Assessment Innovation Fund. Thanks uh, Kenji and Jonathan for hosting us um, and uh, letting us letting us talk to everybody and. Um, I think we'll we'll end there and say have a good day everyone and hopefully we'll see you soon um as a as an AIF applicant.